welcome. We have our next guest, David Bentall on the Legacy by Design series. I was so blessed the first time I heard David's story. Um, so I know we're all in such a treat. So David, welcome. Let's Thanks. share with everybody, um, tell everyone who you are, what you do, and what do you stand for in this world? Well, thanks, Christine, and thanks so much for the opportunity. Um, I think if you, who am I? I, I wanna start by saying I'm a grandpa of eight, uh, and that comes from being a father of four and a husband happily for 42 years. So who I am, I'm a, I'm a husband and a, and a father and a proud grandfather. Uh, and for the last 25 years, uh, on, a, on a personal level, I've been a competitive water skier, something I've been passionate about my whole life, but for the last 25 years, uh, I've been uh, training and competing. So that's who I am. Uh, what I do is quite different. Uh, I'm an author, uh, excited that this week just uh, released my third book. I'm an educator. I teach at the University of British Columbia and also uh, do many workshops for families and business. I'm also a family enterprise advisor, so I work advising families, helping them with intergenerational succession. And then uh, lastly, amongst all the hats that I wear, I'm also an executive coach, so mentoring primarily successors in business, but other executives as well. So, uh, that, Christina, that's a little bit about who I am and, and what I do. And then what do I stand for? I stand for the importance of family. And I say that both in my personal life and my professional life. I have a grandfather and a father who modeled for me putting family above all else. And so as a, in my life, there's always a tension that you can always put in more hours in the office. And so for me, uh, being able to make sure that family is more important than business in my own personal life. And then I stand for that with the clients that I work with. The families that I work with, there's always the tension between what is more important what, the business or the family. And uh, just last week I was talking to a, a colleague and she said that one of her mentors said that no amount of money is, wor is worth one broken relationship. And so I stand for the importance of family is more important than business, more important than, than our financial resources. So Christina, that's a little bit about me and what I stand for. Oh man, that's so beautiful. One, I'm picturing the eight grandkids watching grandpa competitive water ski and how fun that must be. Grandpa's so cool. <laughs> so I love that and that picture of that. And, and the last thing you said, I, you know, I, I've said a similar thing when I was going through with my dad and, and we started having a, you know, relational struggles when he was going through his health journey. And I said, no amount of treasures in the world is worth my relationship with my daddy, you know, so absolutely. I love that. So what does legacy mean to you and why is it important? Well, thank you. I, I, my second book I wrote was called Leaving a Legacy. So I thought quite a bit about what does legacy mean. And I think, you know, in, in layman's terms, legacy is what we leave behind. And so, you know, people tend to think about the money they leave behind or the assets they leave behind. But, you know, I had a, I mentioned earlier, my grandfather and my father were men that, he had a huge impact on my life and the legacy they left me was more in terms of the men, the type of people that they were. So they left me a, a legacy similar to the one I'd like to leave. They left me a legacy that included uh, great relationships. They left me a legacy of a loving family. They left me a legacy of generosity. They were very generous with their lives and with their pocketbooks. They left me a legacy of a fine reputation. I remember my dad saying, I think he was quoting Shakespeare, who said, if a man steals from you your good name, he steals from you something which is of no value to him, but something that you can never repurchase. And so, you know, I have been blessed with uh, coming from a family of a fine name. So, so legacy for me, Christina, means these kinds of things, that the, the qualities of life that we live, we, we leave our children a legacy by how we live, the character, traits that we exhibit and how we have loved. So I think those are the most important things for me in terms of legacy. Oh, beautiful. And so let's talk about, I know you're a third generation Bental. And so let's tell, talk a little bit about your family and the family business. Great, well, so um, my grandpa came from England in 1911 and I won't give you everything that happened in the last 110 years, but uh, my grandpa came from England in 1911 and very soon became prominent because as an engineer, 
he designed what, what at the time was the tallest building in the British Empire. So he built a business based on solid engineering and actually helping our clients to value engineer every building project. He was looking for how he could stretch our clients' dollars to get the biggest bang for the buck by being sure that design was done right. I remember growing up as a child, I think one of the first sentences I learned was design determines cost. And so uh, that was my grandpa and he established a, a construction company that also was integrated with design because he was an engineer. And then in the midst of the depression, uh, we had the opportunity to build a new building for General Motors uh, and they put it on hold because they didn't have the money. So back in 1931, they didn't have the money to build a building. And my grandpa said, well, how about if we build the building and lease it to you? And they said, well, that'd be wonderful. So my grandpa came home, talked to our VP finance and he said, excuse me, Charlie, you're telling me that the largest corporation in the industrial world doesn't have the money to build a building and we're gonna build it for them. Like you got rocks in your head. And my grandpa said, if the largest corporation in the industrial world will sign the lease, why wouldn't we build it? And so in the middle of the depression, my grandpa began our real estate development business. And that's what my dad really focused on. So he focused on office buildings and shopping centers and developing a portfolio of properties. And so granddad ran the company for 40 years, 1915 to 1955. And then my dad worked in the family business, believe it or not, Christina, from 38 to 88, 50 years continuously working for our family firm. And uh, I had the privilege of working in our family business for 20 years. And so uh, by the time I joined the firm, we had also had integrated uh, services, including millwork design and uh, uh, property management and leasing. And so we were fully integrated real estate and construction firm. So great privilege to follow my dad and my grandpa's footsteps into our family business. Oh, what a great story. And so I know at one point, uh, something changed dramatically. What happened? Yeah, it's, it's sad to think back because, you know, when I've described it, there's so many positive, so many wonderful things. And in fact, my dad and my, and my, my uncle Bob worked in the business together. I, meant, I didn't mention this, but my grandfather had three boys. Uh, my dad was the middle child. The eldest was Howard. He was a pastor, so he didn't work in the business. My grandfather always said that my uncle Howard had made the wisest choice to choose to spend his life working as a pastor. My dad being the second eldest became the president of the company after grandpa. And then my uncle Bob joined the family business and was the third uh, member of the next generation. But after working together for many years, uh, my uncles became uh, eager to have more influence. And one day they added up the shares and realized that they had majority control. And so they decided they didn't want my dad anymore. Uh, they didn't want me anymore. Uh, and they didn't want the business anymore. And so everything was sold, Christina. And so what could have been a wonderful 100th birthday uh, celebration nine years ago was really a sad point in time because there was no more, no more harmony in the family, no more the family legacy of the business. And uh, so it was a it was a real tragic end to what had been a wonderful success story up until that time. Mm. Wow, 100th anniversary and absolutely. So was there a formal like secession plan in place? And like, and, and what has your experience been with succession plans? Well, it's so interesting, Christina, because uh, Joe Astrakhan from Kennesaw State University uh, did a research project a number of years ago and he interviewed 18,000 American families and wanted to find out whether having a written succession plan would help families to be able to successfully navigate from one generation to the next. And uh, a lot of people were interested in knowing the answer to that question. Joe, of course, was hoping to find out that yes, having a written succession plan would help navigate from one generation to the next. He was very disappointed to discover that there's no correlation. Having a written succession plan and having a successful succession are not correlated. It doesn't make any difference. But when Joe poured over the data, he's a wonderful researcher, when he poured over the data, he discovered through regression analysis that there were three things that did make a difference. In other words, there were three things that could help a family to be successful with intergenerational succession. The first thing he discovered is having regular family meetings helps. The second thing he discovered was having a board of directors with independent non-family members on the board can be helpful. And the third thing is having some form of strategic planning process. Each of these three things can help families 
And so frankly, that's what I've spent my time doing for the last 22 years after leaving our family company in 1998. I've been working with families to help them, frankly, facilitating for them family meetings, helping them recruit independent members for their boards of directors or advisory board, and encouraging them to make sure they have a clear, agreed upon strategic direction. So uh, my experience with succession, uh, I, I, I suppose you maybe want me to talk about that more personally, but there, that's my, my theory. Speaking as a professor, that's my experience with succession. Yeah, but I believe you've been part of a few successions, not just the first one in the family, but I feel like, feel like you've been a part, of, I believe you've been a part of a few more. Um, did any, and how did those, those ones go any different? Well, yeah, it's interesting. So if you describe the, the first one, I explained to you a little bit, you know, I was in our third generation, I was the, of 11 cousins, I was the only one working in the business. There were seven women in our generation. And at that time, you know, going back now, what, to 40 years ago and, and beyond, all of the women in our generation chose at least to begin with to be full-time homemakers. So none of them joined the family business. Maybe there wasn't even an invitation for them at that time. I know my dad didn't think women belonged in construction, although my, my sister protested quite loudly about that. But um, I had then, that, so that left, if the women were not going to be in the business, what about the four of us guys in the next generation? And my cousin, uh, Rob, chose to become uh, a pastor, full-time pastor. My brother, Chuck, chose to become an architect, although not working in the business, but rather having his own practice. And then my cousin Barney, similar age to me, uh, selected from a, for a career to be a musician and a recording artist. And so really I was the only one left of the 11 cousins. So when I joined the family business, I was my dad's last and only hope he used to say. And so when that all blew up and the business was sold, you could say in a word, it was um, a tragic disappointment or two words, I guess, a tragic disappointment. But then as a result of my uncle deciding to sell the business, they went, they took public the real estate assets and the real estate business. So prior to doing that, they sold the construction business. And my dad put up his hand and said, can, can my, my children and I buy that? So my sisters and I came together and we purchased the construction business. And so I had the privilege of co-owning that business for 10 years with my sisters. It was, a, it was a substantial company. The last year that we were operating that together in 1998, we were doing $300 million worth of work. So it was a big uh, commercial construction business with offices in five cities. And I had a chance to become a successor again, uh, having failed in my first go round, hoping to lead our the Bentall real estate business. I became the president of our construction company. I had a wonderful 10 years with my sisters leading that business and running it. And so, Christina, if my life ended there, you would say, David, you had two experiences with succession. And I'd say, yes, the first one was awful. And the second one was fantastic. And we saw the business grow, had good relationships, and it was a, a wonderful experience. But my, my life didn't end there. On the 10th anniversary of- There's more, wait, there's more. <laughs> on, on, on our, as our 10th anniversary of, of our partnership uh, came along, my brother-in-law said to me, David, you own 40% of the company. You're now president and CEO of the business. Why don't you buy your sisters out and you can own the business? And I remember going home and saying to my wife, I'm not sure I even want to be in construction. Real estate was what fascinated me and what I was passionate about. And so I somewhat reluctantly made an offer to my brother, a good faith offer to buy the business from my brother-in-law, but my heart wasn't really in it because I wasn't sure I wanted to be there for the rest of my life. And so when my brother-in-law said, David, I think the company's worth more than your offer. Uh, we put together an agreement where he purchased my shares. And so I ended up uh, selling the business to an, a third party and then transitioning out. And uh, so, Christina, I've sometimes joked, one of my friends, one of my water ski buddies is in the Guinness Book of World Records actually twice. And I thought maybe I should submit my name to the Guinness Book of World Records because I think, near as I can tell, I'm the only man alive who's been through succession three times, all in the same family, all with the same business, and all before my 40th birthday. And frankly, they were all radically different. One was terrible, one was good, and one was kind of in between. So I've had a bit of experience with succession, so. Yeah, absolutely. And if you were, um, based on your family and everything you experienced, if you were gonna advise an owner, a member of the family business, you know, to really avoid what happened to you, what would you tell them? Well, Christina, in my 
book leaving a legacy. I think I wrote about 25 things, 25 things that I wish we'd done, but maybe a couple of the highlights. Uh, the first thing is uh, if, I, if anybody who's listening is a family enterprise owner or a manager, the first thing is to get the shareholders to agree on a common vision. At the end of all of those years, with all the good things that I've described, my uncle's, my uncle Bob's vision was to take the company public. My uncle Howard's vision was to give all the money to charity. My dad's vision was to transition the business to the next generation and have the legacy carry on. So we had three brothers who had radically different ideas about their vision. And so the first thing, Christina, is to get the shareholders to agree on what the heck are we doing this all for? I think that's the number one. And the second thing is to invite the next generation, the potential successors, to explore, do they want to be partners? Uh, so often for tax planning and other reasons, uh, members of the next generation are gifted shares or shares are transferred to the next generation and equally so that they're treated fairly. But uh, often the kids are never asked, do you want to be partners? And so those are the two main things that I would start with, Christine. Get a shared vision and find out if the next generation want to be partners. Well, great. And so with all of that, you know, now, you know, you mentioned earlier that you're now supporting other families. And so you're now helping other successors. Was it right away that you said, okay, my experience, this is what I wanted to do? Or what moment did you decide to kind of, you know, that that experience shaped in kind of your purpose differently? Well, to be honest, you know, I felt a bit like Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall and just trying to put my life back together for a while. And for but honestly, it was about four, for four years, I was really struggling. You know, what did God have for me in my life? And I remember my sister made it quite confusing because she, my younger sister, youngest sister, actually she's 10 years older than me. I call her my little sister because she's short, shorter than me. But my, my, my little sister, Mary said to me after the business was sold, she said, now you can do what God always intended you to do with your life. And I said, and what do you think that is? And by way of background, she was an elementary school teacher and my wife was an elementary school teacher. And so I, I, I was fascinated when my sister said, now you can do what God always intended you to do. But then when she told me what that was, I was angry because she said, now you can be a teacher. And I'm going, what? You want me to teach elementary school? I thought I was an executive. I went to business school not to teach elementary school. And of course, my sister, was, she, was, she was not saying teach elementary school, but she was saying you should be a teacher. And I really wrestled with that, Christina. I did not want to be a teacher. And I used to very condescendingly say, I aspire to be a teacher as much as I aspire to be a sanitary engineer. I just thought I was above that. It was my pride speaking, frankly. But as I began over the next four years to sort out what the opportunities were for me, people kept asking me to speak about my experience. What happened to you? How did you guys mess up that wonderful family business that you had? And one thing or another, the university asked me to set up a center for family business study. I kept getting asked to speak and teach and do workshops and consult the families. And so it was really the invitation of others to help them to avoid what happened to us that really uh, transitioned my life. And I've discovered that my sister was right. Uh, God wired me to be a teacher. And so I have great passion sharing, frankly, the mistakes we made and what people can learn from them, so. Oh, I love that. And so um, share with us a few more when you think of um, just for families, you know, as a successor. So I know you, you have a new book that recently came out, Dear Younger Me, which I'm guessing, uh, first give us a context of, of what, what made you write that book first before we get into some of the, the guts of it. Great. Well, the context for writing that book is quite, quite uh, actually humorous in a way because I was on the way home from two family meetings, two different cities with two different families. And I was on the airplane flying home from these meetings. And I, I was well prepared for the meetings, but they hadn't gone very well. And I was ruminating on why things hadn't gone very well. And I remember thinking meeting number one didn't go very well because one of the members of the next generation was just plain angry. And his anger kind of spilled over and spoiled the meeting. And I thought that was, so that's his fault. And then I was thinking about the second meeting and one of the members of the next generation was quite frankly, had a chip on his shoulder, unforgiving towards his parents for something they'd done decades ago. And so as I thought about that, I'm going, okay, so we had angry and we had unforgiving. That's why those meetings didn't go very well. And I thought, good thing I wasn't like that. 
when I was younger, was I? And I began to think, gee, I'd been angry and unforgiving and uh, gee, I, I wonder whether there was anything else I did that was maybe unhelpful. And Christina, on that plane, that day, I only had an hour, but it didn't take me long on that flight home to write, I was able to write out 10 things, that, 10 ways I had been unhelpful. I had been impatient and I'd been overly critical of others. I'd been lacked empathy. I didn't listen to anybody and uh, didn't take me long to realize that I had been uh, very unhelpful in my circumstance. And yeah, I could, it would have been better if we'd had a shared vision. Yeah, it'd be good if we talked about whether we want to be partners, all those other things. But I began to realize that I had been a big part of the problem. And so I began to think maybe it'd be helpful if I wrote a book for the next generation to help them learn from my experience. And so that's what I've written about the nine things that, uh, that I wish I had, the nine traits that I wish I'd cultivated in my own life that I think would have made me a better actor in the drama that was our family business. Oh, great. So let's talk about a few of those traits. So what are the few of those lessons that dear younger me would have loved to have learned? Well, I think, the, the, let's talk about the first three. Uh, uh, I think humility, curiosity, and listening. Uh, Christina, you know, if I had been more humble, I would have recognized that my dad and my uncle had some things to teach me rather than the other way around. I graduated out of business school. I thought they didn't know a thing. It didn't, it didn't matter that my dad had been with the business for 40 years and my uncle 38 years when I joined the company. I thought I knew everything and I didn't know anything. So a little humility would have helped me to listen a little bit more. And that, that's the second thing, listening. I, I was so busy talking, talking at them. Uh, wouldn't it have been wonderful if I'd been willing to listen and to allow them to mentor me? And I've thought about it, you know, in, in most professions, there's a period of apprenticeship. If you're a tradesman, if you're a carpenter or a pipe fitter or an electrician, you have an apprenticeship. You can't be a tradesman until you learn from the elder uh, tradespeople. So, I, I would, I could have been an apprentice. If you think about the legal and accounting or engineering professions, you can't be um, a full member of the, of the profession until you've also gone through your, your articles or your apprenticeship. I arrived in our family company not wanting to listen, not recognizing that I was in an apprenticeship. So the, the first two things, humility and listening would have made a difference. And then curiosity. I thought I knew everything. I remember my wife confronting me with that, with that one day we were chatting over breakfast. And she said, David, I, I think I got the same problem with you that your uncles do. And I said, and what would that be? She said, well, you think you're always right. And I said, what's wrong with that? And uh, honestly, Christine, I wasn't joking. I actually thought I was always right. And so uh, I was never curious just about well, how, why did other people think things differently? And so I think curiosity would have gone a long ways to to help me be different. So those are three quick examples of, of, some, of some of the nine traits, uh, Christina. Awesome. And so now, I mean, over all the years, I'm sure you've worked with, I don't know how many has it been, hundreds of families or, you know, you probably are between <laughs> teaching and <laughs> successors and doing that. So I know you have your own experience, but also thinking about the, the families you've worked with. Um, would you say is there some themes because and are also like, how do they know when they want you to come in? Like, are they just like going like, hey, David, hey, David, or, you know, so where is it usually crisis mode or, you know, kind of give us some insights when families bring you in and what's the best way to do it versus the way maybe some do do it? <laughs> well, Christine, it's interesting. I'm so glad you asked that today because yesterday I got a phone call from a, a, a young leader who has his oldest child is 21, a son, and he has three daughters who are 19 and 12 and nine. And he called me and said, David, I want to start having family meetings. And I said, why is that? And he said, because I wanna do this right. And I said, you are the first and only person who's called me in my entire professional life in the last 25 years, who's called at that early stage. And, and I think about that, uh, Christina, as up the river from the waterfall, we're all gonna go over a waterfall one day, uh, or there's a risk we'll go over a waterfall one day if we don't pay attention to what we're doing. And many people phone me and they're about to go off the waterfall and they say, David, 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 help. we've got this crisis. We're about to, things are falling apart. Can you help us? And so we, I'm trying to throw them branches in the river to get them out of the river before they go off the waterfall. So often people call me because they are about to go over the waterfall and are in a crisis. They're, 
they're having a disagreement about one thing or another. Some people phone me after a crisis, after everything's blown up and they're at the bottom of the waterfall, the boat sunk and they're floundering around trying to swim to shore. And they say, can you help us to try and rebuild our lives? Um, and so tragically, too often people call when they're either just about to go over, <laughs> over the waterfall or they have. Uh, some people have the wisdom to call me before, like this gentleman yesterday, well before. And um, I think the reason that people don't call is because every family in the world falls more or less into one of two categories. The first category is they're getting along. If they're getting along, they don't perceive the need for any help. If they're not getting along, they don't want to talk about it. And so nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants advice from an external third party family enterprise advisor because they're either getting along and don't need it or they're not getting along and don't want to talk about it. So it is hard. So uh, uh, most people call me when they're, they see the waterfall. Let's talk, let's talk about it that way. And is there some things you can think of, of like commonalities of, you know, of the, you know, as they're seeing the waterfall, is there some commonalities of like, did they not plan right? Is it just they're not having meetings? Or, you know, is there some kind of themes that kind of what causes some of that boiling to happen that you, you kind of noticed over the years? Yeah, I think a couple of things. The first is that I have noticed uh, of the families that I work with, uh, this is not a, a, an academic uh, uh, study, but just generally, if I, if I think about, the, 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 as you say, well over 100 families and well over several hundred uh, successors I've worked with in the last 20 years. If we put them in two categories, the families that today are kind of doing fairly well, the successors are doing quite well today and the ones that are having more of a struggle, the ones who are doing a great job by and large are ones who have had experience outside the family company. They've gone not only to university, but they've gone to work elsewhere. Many people put in their uh, their employment policy that in families that you should work outside the company or even are required to work outside the company for two years or five years. I've seen others who actually said 10 years. And I think about SC Johnson, Fisk Johnson's now the chairman and CEO of the SC Johnson company. And he took six earned degrees before joining the family company. Uh, and he was getting himself ready. And family firms that tend to do well are ones where the successors get well-educated and get experience elsewhere before they join. So that's one theme. And the other theme that I, I, I see that is a, a very prominent one is that the families that tend to do the best are ones where they develop good communication skills. When I think about a family from Montreal, the Gaspé Bobian family. When they started having family meetings, their mom was a PhD in psychology. And so she started having the family meet together. All three of the kids have Harvard MBA, so they're a smart bunch. Three years of family meeting, all they did was focus on how to communicate better. That's all they did. And that's created the foundation for them that has been enormously helpful. So external experience and communication for me are two of the most important things that I would emphasize for families. Yeah. And I think of that family working on that communication for three years. Like, I, I just think about the impact that's going to have, you know, in a hundred years and, and, and kind of, you know, changing the trajectory. And, and so on the first, first one, you talked about education. So when you're talking about education, you know, because as a successor coming in, do you mean education in the way of degrees? Do you mean it in education and how to run the business? Do you mean in edu you know, so when you say education, what do you kind of mean a little more about education? Sure. Now, you know, some people say that they don't need a university education. Those are irrelevant because we know there's lots of billionaires who dropped out of school. And uh, if you think you're going to be the next Bill Gates, maybe you don't need to go to school. You could drop out of school if you want. But uh, I remember interviewing a, a very prominent uh, leader from Venezuela who's actually had to leave Venezuela because all of their, their family assets were, uh, were confiscated uh, by the government in Venezuela. So they've mm -hmm. set up as a family in Miami and trying to rebuild their business. And I talked to this family, the chair of their family office. And by the way, they've had 200, last month, their 250th consecutive monthly family meeting. Think about that for a second. 250 consecutive <laughs> months family meeting. And, I, and I, we were talking about education. I said, tell me what you believe. And I believe exactly what he's shared. 
He said, David, I believe in both and. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I believe in the value of higher education. Because he said, if you go into the marketplace and you work hard and you've got integrity and you've got good ideas and your competition are, are well-educated and uh, sorry, your competition work hard and got good ideas, but they're not as well-educated, you're gonna have a competitive advantage. So he said, you're taking a huge risk to say, well, education doesn't matter. I'm gonna make up for it by good ideas and hard work because your competition may have those as well. So he said, let's invest in education in the professional and in the formal sense. And I believe in that wholeheartedly. But in addition, he said, what we've done as a family in our 250 meetings consecutive every month is we've been providing mentoring within the family, which is very informal. Hanging out with his uncles is how he learned about the business. Hanging out with his uncles is how he learned about family relationships and family dynamics. So I think both are, it's a both and, Christine. I think both are exceedingly important. And one more question on that. So, you know, because we think of the first generation, you know, they spent all those years, they, you know, had all the things where maybe they had to, you know, struggle for payroll and they had, you know, had to do all those things that really gave them the way of thinking to, to hire problem solve along the way. And, you know, really be entrusted and, and go through there. But now you've got the younger generation who didn't really go through a lot of that. So do you think the mentoring really helps with that? Or do you think there's a process to say like, hey, let's start them with a, 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 few, a little bit of responsibility and then we kind of grow it. So how do you help them who didn't go through all of those, you know, along the gradient to become that successful entrepreneur and think of those big problems? What's some ways to kind of like, ease the successors into that? Well, wonderful question. Uh, Christina, I've got a couple of thoughts on it. The, the first I'd like to share with you about another family that, I've, that I know of, and I think what they did was exemplary. And then also like to talk a little bit about some elements of my career that I think were also very helpful. So I want to talk to you a little bit about Larry Rosen. So in Canada, the number one uh, uh, menswear, uh, at least luxury menswear <coughs> store is, no, is known as Harry Rosen, and Larry is Harry's son. And when Larry was interested in joining the family firm, his dad said, first of all, you must work outside the company at least five years. So Larry got well prepared. He did, a, first of all, an undergrad degree, then he took a law degree, and then he took a, a master's in business. So he got himself well-educated formally. And then secondly, he went to work with the law firm for several years before joining the family firm. So we got outside work experience, understood what it meant to actually respond to a boss that wasn't his dad. And then he joined the family company and he started at the lowest rung on the totem pole. So for them in that company, he worked a little bit in their shipping and receiving and in their uh, warehouse area, and then worked in their buying area and then worked on the floor selling. So he had a chance to learn from the bottom up how everything worked. And it took, he had 15 years lurking, learning everything uh, in the business before he was given the responsibility to lead the company. So I think that's a wonderful balance of quality education, working outside and then working up from, from the bottom. In terms of my own experience, you know, I had the opportunity early in my career after taking my college degree in business to travel and work in each of the different uh, geographic areas our companies operated. So I worked in Vancouver in our head office. And then I worked in one of our uh, smaller subsidiaries in Langley. And then I worked in Alberta for a couple of years. Then I worked outside our firm in Toronto for a couple of years with one of the largest real estate development companies in North America at the time, Cadillac Fairview. Then I went to, to uh, California and worked for a firm we were partnering with. So worked with other non-family mentors. And so I had a great chance to work in different geography and outside the business. And then when I joined the family firm and uh, had a chance to uh, begin to learn what the construction side of the business was about. Uh, I was mentored by a non-family leader of the, who, who, Dick Myers, who was president and CEO. I think that's a very important thing, non-family mentor in the business. And, and I remember Dick, every six months, he'd sit me down and um, I, maybe a little bit unfair to describe it as him saying, here's everything you've done wrong lately, David. But it was kind of felt like that a lot. Uh, but he would, uh, one time I had 11 vice presidents working for me and he would sit down with each of them first and say, what's David done wrong lately? And then he'd come and dump his news on the table and, and 
helped me to learn to fit to to um, work my way through what did I need to do in terms of my growth in order to behave differently and to lead differently. And so I think the mentoring inside the family business as I was growing. And then finally, the one thing that Dick did is preparing me to be president. He gave me incremental roles. So my first assignment was to look after the human resources area. So I had our director of HR and their staff of three working for me. And then six months later, I was given the Alberta division. So I had about 50 people and two or three direct reports. And gradually, and then the Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba were added, and then BC. So gradually, you know, I went from three people reporting to me to 150 salary employees and 350 field employees over a two and a half year period of time, but in increments. And I think, and under the tutelage of a non family leader. So, uh, Christina, does that give you a flavor of how I think it could be done well? Oh, I think those were just, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was great advice and, and just tips. And I, I think that's, and I love the, non-family member i mean what what a great way because they're also getting mentored with somebody that they don't see at the dinner table and we're going to have a different relationship with interacting and so no, i thought that was just some, some great ways so yeah absolutely and so to shift gears a little bit i know recently you developed a special program regarding emotional intelligence can you tell us why you did that and, and a little bit how it works Sure. Well, the why, the why I think is, is actually quite funny. So I finished writing my book, Dear Younger Me, about the nine ways that I think I had been unhelpful and how these nine traits, humility and curiosity and listening and other things could help successors. But I'm not, I don't write how to books. I tend to write how not to books. <laughs> Here's what not to do. Don't do what David did. And when I finished reading, writing the book, I remember thinking if someone reads this, they might conclude David was dumb to not do that. I don't want to be dumb like David. And I thought, that's probably a lousy outcome for this book. <laughs> if everybody just says David was dumb, I don't want to be dumb. And so I thought, what can I do? Because people aren't going to learn curiosity and listening and humility just by reading a book from, by me. And so I banded together with a couple of colleagues who are uh, outstanding executive coaches, both of them, uh, Laura North and Dave Phillips, who've been coaching executives for well over 20 years. And we created a program that's offered now online in a virtual environment that includes, yes, sections from my book, yes, lectures that I've done and taped audio lectures and fireside chats that people can watch online. And yes, it also includes group sessions for, that I lead with every other week with participants who are successors in the family business. But to help really accelerate people's learning, we've offered to every participant in our group program that they would have individual one-on-one -on -one coaching for three months to help them learn to internalize and to be able to cultivate listening and curiosity and humility in their own life. So it's a, we've just had two, we just wrapped up last Thursday, uh, our first official cohort. You know, it's designed a small group. We had 10 folks who participate. Maximum we would have allowed would have been a dozen because we want people to learn from each other. And so we had two women from Geneva, Switzerland, a part of the program. And we've had people from across North America participating. So it's an exciting thing that we're doing. And again, in, in this virtual world, it can all be done through Zoom and through online lectures and through uh, online coaching. So it's been really exciting, Christina. And uh, I remember one of, one of the participants just this week sent a note through and uh, their, their statement was, we are learning in this program what nobody in the culture is doing. This is so fantastic. So uh, we're really excited about the response we've had so far. So that's what we're working on right now. Oh, I love that. And I think back, I remember I, I did an uh, emotional intelligence leadership program and it's so true about experiencing it. Cause I remember we did this as a kind of like a game, it was a simulated game, but the way that it did, that did it, it basically showed how you showed up as a leader. And yeah. during it, did you kind of just go off the side and you were frustrated? Did you sit down and not say anything? Did you take charge? And I just remember I, I learned some such great lessons of myself um, and, and thinking to myself, there were some things that I was really proud of and some things I was like, oh, that is not what, you know, my intention was, but really experiencing it really held that mirror up for me to see that. So I, so I love that you're doing that. And I think people will get so much value out of it. Well, and you're so right, Christina, we, we often need mirroring to understand uh, where we're at in terms of emotional. Mm -hmm. I think we're often blind. I, I was completely blind to many of my faults. And I think that, um, we need the help of others in the community of others to help us to learn emotional intelligence. Absolutely. 
And also, you know, just let's let's unpack successors a little bit because you have had so much experiences. You know, what are some of the challenges and payoffs uh, that there are for successors? Well, certainly. Well, I, I think that one of the biggest challenges for successors is to develop patience. I haven't mentioned that, but that's one of the nine traits that I've written about. And, you know, when I joined our family firm, my uncle was 55. And at that time, traditionally, you know, going back 40 years ago, at that time, and still today, lots of people think about 65 as the correct retirement age. So I assumed that in 10 years, he'd be retiring. And my dad had told me ever since I was a young boy, he came into the den when I was in grade five. I was watching TV and he said, son, turn off the television, do your homework. And I said, Dad, I'm watching Casper the Friendly Ghost, leave me alone. And he said, David, you, you can't be president unless you do your homework. And so from grade five on, I had been encouraged by my dad to think about myself as the next president of the company. So when I joined the family firm, my uncle's going to retire in 10 years, so I thought. So I created a career development plan for myself and submitted it to my dad and my uncle and said, here's what I think I need to do in order to get trained over the next 10 years. My uncle sat back and looked at it and said, well, David, I think it would take 20 years for you to be ready. And I didn't think about it until many years later, but he, my uncle had had to wait 30 years for his opportunity to lead. And so, you know, it probably hurt his uh, pride or his emotions, uh, feelings for me to say that I could be ready in 10, but he felt I was impatient, which was true. And my dad said, oh, David can be ready in 10. And so they began to argue about it. And I think, Christina, you know, one of the biggest challenges for successors is to be patient. And I, I remember meeting with one family successor. And again, the dad in that case was 55 and he wanted to stay. No, he was 50. And he said he wanted to stay for 15 more years. And his son joined the company and he wanted to become president within five. Well, it doesn't take a math wizard to realize they had a, they had a decade gap in their expectations exactly the same as mine. So I think that's one of the key things that successors, one of the key challenges that successors face. And that's why I think SC Johnson or Fisk Johnson was so wise uh, in waiting, taking many degrees. He stayed outside the business so that he wasn't banging heads with his father, Sam. So one of the key challenges I think is to cultivate patience. I think it's the number one, frankly. Oh, great. You want and to so what are, no, go ahead. Payoffs? Is that what payoffs. you mean? Payoffs, yeah. So I guess uh, a couple of things. What are, one of the payoffs, if a successor can be patient, if they can cultivate listening and humility and curiosity, the things that I'm encouraging them to do, one of the payoffs is that they can have the opportunity to extend the legacy that has been given to them. I remember the first time I wrote out a mission statement for my life, I wrote out that I would like to be a wise and joyful steward of the life and legacy I'd been given. My dad and my grandfather had given me a wonderful legacy, not just the business, but their reputation, et cetera. And so one of the payoffs for successors to be patient, to be humble, to learn to listen, is that they have the opportunity to extend the legacy rather than having to start with a clean sheet of paper and, and do something on their own. Another one of the payoffs is that if we can learn from the elder generation and work with them, take an apprenticeship as we were talking about earlier, there are great networks of relationships that they can build upon. And so, uh, in, you know, set aside there's things like intellectual property they can gain from working within the family company rather than starting on their own. So the payoffs are, are so numerous. If you did the, the pros and cons, should I blow this up in my own face or should I, should I be a little more patient? It's pretty clear that the payoffs are, are usually worth waiting around and, and being willing to cultivate changes in your own character to accommodate timing that works for the elder generation rather than timing that might work for you. Mm, what great advice. And, and so this is the bonus round question. And so the bonus round question, and this might be the hardest question of all, um, you're going to be on a desert island and you only get to take three things with you, not people. What would David take with him? Bonus round, desert island. Is it, well, if there's a lake on it, I'd take a water ski, but and a water <laughs> ski boat and a, and a rope. So the, those are the three. Those are the three things I'd take. But, <laughs> but if I was on a if I was on a desert island, and didn't have uh, anything, I'd take my wife and my Bible and my kids. 
I don't know what oh. <laughs> that's what you want. But if if I could pick tangible objects, I'd I'd take my library because I love to read. And if I had to live mm. on a desert island, I'd I'd want to be able to read. Oh, awesome. And there goes that that's that like curiosity, you know, it's just you know that 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 you know that hunger for knowledge and curiosity. So what is some last parting wisdom you have for the, for our audience? Well, Christina, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to to chat about all these things and frankly to think about how all the mistakes I've made hopefully are serving other families and helping them not make the same mistakes. And um, I, I think one thing that I came across when I was being mentored as a family enterprise advisor, I worked with Nambi de Gaspe Bovian from Montreal and she said, David, I believe that families that learn together tend to stay together. And so, you know, some families are going, how do we do this? How do we start? Where do we start? I, I think the easiest, safest place for families to start is to just learn together. And so I love working with families where we can do workshops and help them learn what do other families do, what works, what doesn't. So one, one thing I'd say is families that learn together tend to stay together. But then as our family experience shows, families that play together tend to stay together. I remember we took a retreat together with our family and uh, I intended and hoped that we'd be able to talk about some important things together. And I came home quite disappointed that I'd paid for this excursion. And yes, we did some kayaking and went to the spa and did some bike riding and had pizza together and played some games. And it was a great time, but we didn't get to talk about the stuff I want to talk about, investments and other things. But then uh, 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 just within a week's time, our three daughters and our two sons-in-law gathered together over the evening. We put together a project to buy a piece of property where the kids could co-invest and be able to develop their own uh, little mini condo project. And, you know, I thought about it as I put my head on my pillow that night and I thought, you know, the fact that we played together enabled us to be able to do that. And so my advice to people, Christina, is to learn together. Just with families that learn together tend to stay together, uh, play together. And then thirdly and finally, uh, pray together. I think that families that pray mm -hmm. together tend to stay together. And so I think uh, it's important for us to talk about our spiritual journey and how that can change our character. You know, I think about all these things, patience and humility and listening, all these things. You know, if I had been uh, more prayerful as a young man, uh, I think I probably would have found it easier to cultivate those character traits. So learn together, play together, pray together. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Learn, play, and pray. I love it. That's so great. And so, David, I know there's going to be many people that are going to want to connect with you further. What's the best way for our listeners to connect with you? Great. Well, Christina, uh, I would be delighted. Anybody who's listening who would like to be in touch with me directly, just send an email directly to me. You can go onto our website if you like, but if you wish, just mail, email me at Bentall, my last name, Bentall, at nextstepadvisors.ca. And tell me how I can help. Uh, I'd be delighted. So Bentall at nextstepadvisors.ca. Oh, wonderful. And I also know you're going to bless them um, with, with, with a gift. And so will you share with them a little, little bit about the gift and why you chose that? Great. Well, Christine, I want to give people a, a choice. So I've written two books about family business, one called Leading a Legacy. And so if you're interested in an excerpt from that, uh, chapter 19 talks all about uh, charitable giving and legacy. And frankly, it talks about, about the first charitable gift I ever gave when I was a 12 year old and what motivated me for the first time to, to write a check to a charity as a 12 year old, an organization called Operation Eyesight that I've been supporting now for 33 years. And so if you want an audio version of chapter 19 of Living a Legacy, send me a note and I'll send you a free copy of that. And then those who are interested in this Dear Younger Me we've been talking about so much, uh, I'm happy to send some excerpts, free excerpts from Dear Younger Me to give you a taste as to what that book's about. So happy to send me an email and I'll respond whichever way or both if you wish. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, David. I know you've given so much great insight, so much wisdom of all the years from your own experience and then also what you've just given back to those you've mentored. So I just thank you for who you are and for what you do and really blessing us in this time together. Well, Christina, thank you. It's been fun. And I appreciate your questions. And thank you for helping me to do what I really want to do with my life. And that is to assist others to grow closer in their families. So thanks very much for the time together. Awesome. Thank you.